you, Bronwyn. Thanks, everybody. Um, let me start the presentation here. Um, so yeah, I, I titled the, the, the subtitle of my talk today is Bugs on Branches as Canaries in the Coal Mine for Global Change. And so what I'm going to tell you about today is this project I created, the Caterpillars Count, and sort of, you know, what it is and, and what we've been learning from it and, and why it's important that you might want to get involved um, because there are some concerns about insect declines and things like that. And it, often we don't have uh, a good understanding of what the historical baseline um, abundant population abundance is uh, for arthropods is. So I'll talk a little bit about you know, the utility of uh, participating and more specifically, like some nitty gritty details, if this is of interest to people, um, what it looks like to participate in this project. Um, so this is a this is a project that is very much open to anybody, and the basic idea is uh, that we participants do these branch surveys. And Bronwyn mentioned iNaturalist, which is an absolutely fantastic uh, project, which I I use all the time myself and it's very easy you can just see something you out of the corner of your eye you see something cool you snap a photo and maybe even if you didn't know yourself you can find out from that photo based on other people chiming in you can find out uh, what what species it is or something like that so iNaturalist um, is a tremendous uh, it's not only is it fun to participate in and collect your list but it's used by scientists like myself to understand, well, just where on the planet do different species occur and what, what times of year are people observing them and that sort of thing. Um, what iNaturalist is not great for though, is for documenting abundance trends, whether things are more abundant than they used to be or less abundant than they used to be. There are some ways of getting at that with iNaturalist data, but the main issue is that, um, it's only this positive um, observational data. By positive, I just mean we only have the records of when people happen to notice something and take a photo. We have no idea, well, how long were they out there looking? How many times did they go out and not see the thing? That's sort of the, the negative data, which actually is really important if you wanna get a sense of density or abundance of an organism. So that is the, you know, filling that gap. That was one of the, the motivations for this project is to do these surveys where you even if you see nothing if you look at a branch and you see nothing you report that and that is actually extremely valuable information so the the the, the nugget and i'll talk a lot more about what these surveys look like but the nugget or the the, the core element of participation is a branch survey and um so we have a, a mobile app and, and we're, actually, we're actually tied in with iNaturalist in the sense that when you do a branch survey with Caterpillar's Count and you, you, maybe you come across a caterpillar, you can take a photo with our app and it will automatically get sent to iNaturalist. So that maybe even if you don't know what species that is, someone will identify it for you later. Um, on our website, and if I have time, I'll demonstrate some of these things, but if, if people are familiar with eBird um, and iNaturalist, they both have ways where you can go on the website and kind of visualize not just your own observations, but summaries of other people's observations, what other people are seeing. So we have a variety of ways to visualize catapult count data on our website. For example, you know, in this, this little graph here, this is showing, um, this is near me in the Botanical Garden at Chapel Hill when the sort of the peak caterpillar abundance in our forest was uh, several years ago now, I think. Um, this project is especially amenable um, or, or really fun to implement at nature centers and parks or with school groups, but it, it can be done, you know, if you're, if you're really interested in bugs and stuff and you have uh, nice woody foliage in your backyard. You can just do it in your own backyard. Um, it is, it's fun to do in groups. And as I'll talk about in a moment, um, 
Although the core unit is a branch survey, um, usually you set up a site with a bunch of branches that you would monitor. So you wouldn't just do a single branch. And so because there's a bunch of branches, that's why often it's easier to do it with a small group of people. You can divide and conquer. Everybody can take a, a couple of branches and, and um, it makes the data a little bit more valuable to have um, that larger sample size. Um, I don't know if anybody in this um, meeting is involved in education at all, but we also on our website, we have a variety of learning activities, um, things that can be done in the classroom or, or outside um, with students, everything from uh, elementary school up to, to college. Um, so that's sort of the, the rough overview. And we started, this project started in 2014. Uh, basically, so I'm in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. It really started in Central North Carolina. Um, but in the intervening years, we've, we've got sites popping up mostly in Eastern North America, but a number of places out West as well. And um, so at this point, we have over 150 sites uh, more than actually it's more than 1500 people now have contributed data and we've sampled over 68,000 branches and recorded over 160,000 bugs. Um, so we, our plan is, this isn't a one and done sort of endeavor. This, I mean, for some participants, certainly it is. And that is, that's just how it goes. And that's totally fine that some people will try it out and, and, um, and that's enough for them. But part of the, the goal of this project is very much to develop a long-term monitoring data set. We wanna know whether things are worse than they used to be in terms of you know, how many bugs are we finding in our backyards, in our parks, et cetera. And um, so again, as I mentioned, there have been some stories about insect declines and things like that due to global change, urbanization, land use change, et cetera. So actually there have been some, you know, sort of alarming headlines over the last several years. Um, the insect apocalypse, um, insectageddon, et cetera. And there have also been, um, so I guess one of the challenges here, and this is a challenge um, for the popular media in part in terms of uh, which stories kind of capture headlines and attention. Certainly when we observe really substantial insect declines in certain places, that is alarming. And those declines in these particular places, they're pretty well documented. And so certainly um, that, that the alarm bell has rung. Um, what's less clear is sort of how general those really dramatic declines are and, and how widespread those declines are. And again, in part, the problem is just that in most of the globe, we don't have good baseline data. We don't know quantitatively what were insect abundances like 40 years ago or 50 years ago, or even 20 years ago. Um, there are other places also where bugs have been studied, where there have not been dramatic declines. And so it's not the case that insects are declining at this alarming rate everywhere. But when someone monitors some kind of insect at a particular location and they find out, oh, it's about the same amount of bugs as last year and 10 years ago and 20 years ago, that doesn't tend to grab very many headlines, right? So, so this, this is a, um, it's a tricky issue in the sense that it's not that we shouldn't be worried. There are clear signs that um, we should be paying attention. Um, but just how widespread and pervasive this problem is, I think we're still kind of building up the evidence base to assess. And that's part of the impetus for this project, Caterpillars Count. Um, I guess that I should have had this up while I was saying all of that stuff. But these are just some other. Um, this, this graphic is, well, it's getting a little bit old now, it's seven or eight years old, but this was, this was trying to be a global synthesis and it was synthesizing published studies from various places and just showing relative to some baseline, uh, if we peg whatever the abundance of Lepidoptera was in 1970, we peg that at one. Um, 
and we integrate over all these studies that there's been this decline. And then other invertebrate groups, it shows this even steeper decline. But again, Im importantly, what, what we need to recognize is, well, what data went into these graphs? It's maybe a dozen or a couple of dozen places from around the globe. And again, the ones that maybe were more likely to get published were maybe the ones that had these declining signals. Um, so we're trying to figure out, and, and this is where having a standardized monitoring approach that where people are using the exact same methodology over a really large spatial scale, um, that helps us better interpret and better integrate you know, patterns over, over these large um, spatial extents that we care about. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna first talk about, um, I guess another scientific question. It's not just my concern with insect declines for insect sake. I know I'm speaking to a LEP group and, and there's every reason to be concerned with LEPs for LEPs sake, for example, but I'm actually a bird ecologist, sorry. So all of my, the, the things that I care about eat the things that you care about potentially, or in some cases. Um, so I'm a bird ecologist and, um, as Bronwyn said, I study patterns of distribution and diversity over really large spatial scales. I use eBird data and breeding bird survey data and um, all of these other great um, sources. And one of the things I started wondering about was, especially for migratory birds, migratory birds that are um, actually by my my examination of eBird in recent weeks, things are already starting to show up in North Carolina. Some warblers are starting to show up that we're not here in the winter. So these things have spent the winter down in Central or South America. And um, why, are they, why do birds migrate north in the first place? Well, largely it's to take advantage of this huge seasonal pulse of resources that um, actually allows them to be more successful at raising their young, right? And, and the timing of those resources is tied to the seasons. So um, hopefully it doesn't look like this in Maryland anymore. Maybe it's starting or soon gonna look like this middle picture, um, right? And then by the time June comes around, everything is beautiful, nice and green. And once all these leaves have emerged, of course, we get all of the herbivores, which are taking advantage of that, um, that pulse in green foliage, right? So a question arises with respect to the impacts of climate change and specifically warming. Um, the, you know, the degree of warming is pretty variable in different parts of the globe. Um, in some places it's warming more in the winter in other places it's warming more in the summer, et cetera. But, um, but on average it's warming. And in some cases that warming is resulting in leaves coming out a little bit earlier. And if the leaves come out earlier, then, and in fact, we often see this with, with the flight periods of certain butterflies, for example, is that, oh, if you have a really warm spring, things might start um, flying around being active um, earlier compared to in a, a later or colder year, right? So if on average things are shifting earlier, um, then what might this mean for birds that are wintering down in Central or South America that don't realize that Maryland is early this year, right? Um, so as a bird ecologist, that, that was sort of, um, some of the questions that I had in my head. So again, are insects declining and are insects shifting that seasonal timing? And if they are, by how much? Um, so those are some of the main science questions that I was hoping to get at um, by and, and, and provided some of the motivation for creating this, this project in the first place. And this is maybe just a gratuitous way to include a cool animation from eBird. Um, but this is so indigo bunting. I don't think indigo buntings have showed up yet in North Carolina this year. But just to, to again, emphasize this pattern, right? So it's spending the winter in Central America. In the spring, it shoots forward. And so what, what is available by the time it gets to Maryland, right? Um, and that may vary from year to year. It may vary with climate, the timing of the bird itself. Some birds actually are, seem to be pretty good at adjusting the timing of migration. And you know, if it's an early year, they're coming, you know, 
earlier, meaning a warmer, earlier green up year. They're actually coming earlier, but, but some bird species seem to um, not be aware, to be less sensitive to that, that change in sort of early, late year. And those are ones that might be in trouble. Um, so with this large cadre of eyes on the ground that have, you know, they have provided the data for this animation we just watched for indigo bunting, right? So I'm trying to develop an army of people who can come up with equally important information on the seasonal timing and availability and abundance of foliage arthropods. And so now I just want to, I'll share a little bit about what we've learned so far and the kinds of patterns we can see. Um, so one of the first things uh, we want to do when we launch a project like this is just confirm or validate that um, data collected by volunteers from you know, around the globe are providing reliable data. They're providing data that matches what, say, trained scientists are collecting. So this first graph is just showing that yes, they, they broadly report you know, the same breakdown. So th this is a comparison done here in North Carolina at a nearby natural area. So the same natural area and, and some days it was sampled by um, trained scientists and some days by citizen scientists, um, but largely they found uh, pretty similar proportions of the different arthropods. And here's just an example. I mentioned that when you take a photo with our app, it goes to iNaturalist. So these are some of the photos in our iNaturalist account. Um, and then these other two graphs, well, the middle one is just showing on the x-axis, it's the estimate of density, like abundance for a particular arthropod group. So these, these symbols are color-coded um, to represent these different groups, right? So um, the, the beetles are sort of our most common group. These are in pink here or pink and red. And so if we just pick one of them, and there's two different survey methods, which I'll talk about in a minute. But if we just pick this one, this is just saying, um, this is the density estimated by a trained scientist. And the Y value is the density estimated by the citizen scientist volunteers. And so all of these, all of these shapes and colors more or less lie right along this one-to-one -one line, which is just saying that, yeah, both people, there might be a little bit of deviation in this case, um, the trained scientists saw a, maybe a little bit higher density of beetles um, using this survey method than the, than the citizen scientists. Um, for this triangle, the citizen scientists saw a little bit higher density than the trained scientists. But overall, these, esti these estimates all kind of lie on this one-to-one -one line, which means um, we're pretty much uh, observing the same density. Um, and then this this uh, last panel here is just showing that phenology or that seasonal timing. Um, and both the, the trained scientists and the citizen scientists kind of show this exact same ramp up in caterpillars over the, the year and the same initial peak with a decrease. And there's a little bit of, it's unclear to me actually whether we're missing a data point in here or what's going on in the last two weeks. But those first, those first uh, that first month or so, matches pretty well. So, so all of this gave us um, a lot of confidence, right? That um, if people are you know, first trained such that they can identify uh, these different groups, and I'll get more in, again into exactly what you record when you do the survey, um, then, then you can collect reliable data, data that will be really useful for answering these scientific questions. Um, let me just give you an example again, a little bit of a deep dive for this one spot that's that's near um, near me in Chapel Hill, North Carolina here, and that's the North Carolina Botanical Garden, um, where we've been surveying it. We've been surveying that site every year since 2015. And so, in 2015 itself, it seemed like the peak of caterpillars is right around mid June. And again, this is like perfect timing. If you're a migratory foliage gleaning bird, that's about, you know, you arrive maybe in early May and you take a week to find a mate and then you guys have to build a nest and then you lay eggs. And then it takes a couple of weeks to incubate those eggs. And then you have some young. 
that are hatching and they're these hungry mouths that are constantly chirping at you like feed me feed me already okay you need caterpillars you need them fast you need a lot of them this middle of june for north carolina that's like almost perfect timing um for it to have that peak what we found as we continued doing these surveys year after year is that there's a tremendous amount of variation in when that main peak of caterpillar availability is. And um, you know what I thought I would see was just, okay, there's this general peak and it's gonna shift backwards or forwards by a few days to a week, depending on you know, whether it was a cold spring or a warm spring. But in 2016, the very next year, instead we have this, this large peak in early July. And that's not just the same that's presumably not just the same LEP species getting delayed by three weeks. That's probably, this peak reflects probably a different set of species in the forest that happened to have a good year. Um, and you can see actually in 2015, I mean, there, there, it seems like there's some hint of a peak in this period of time, although it wasn't as big in 2016. Like, okay, so maybe that's just my hand wavy explanation. And then, in 2017, um, a first of all, much higher caterpillar density um, than we had seen in the previous two years. The timing of that peak, sort of intermediate. Um, 2018 matched pretty well with 2016, but maybe an extra, uh, an extra later peak. 2019. So. My main point from, from doing this just for, for uh, seven or eight years now is that it really takes doing this for multiple years to even start to get a handle on what's normal. I still don't know actually what's normal at North Carolina Botanical Garden. But 2019 was a tremendous year for LEPs. Um, this peak here, it's mid-June. It's a little bit past mid-June, but birds certainly would have been able to take advantage of that peak. Um, in terms of feeding their, their young. Um, but then 2020 and 2021 were absolutely horrible years for caterpillars. There was basically almost nothing uh, at all until, until July. So those would have been really tough years for birds. Um, so I, I mean, I'm still, it's, it's not quite enough years really to be able to figure out the mechanism underlying these various peaks. My main takeaway is like, oh my gosh, it's so interesting how variable this pattern of caterpillar phenology is from year to year. I wanna, I wanna just keep, keep doing this every year because I really wanna see what's gonna happen next. And I wanna to start to get enough data so that I can start to tease apart some potential explanations. Can I predict this just based on you know, timing of rainfall and spring, you know, cold snaps or things like that, or, you know, what is it? Uh, but so that gives you a sense of how much variation there could be at a single site from year to year. Um, we, you know, we've collected, I showed you that map earlier, we've, we've got caterpillar data, density data from um, throughout East North America. And so this is just one way of summarizing how that average number of caterpillars per branch varies uh, geographically. And it's not a very smooth pattern. And um, we've kind of averaged, we're using this, these little hex, hexagonal grid cells to kind of, as a way to, to summarize um, sites, sites falling within a single one of these cells uh, are just getting averaged together. Um, but there's a tremendous amount of variation from place to place. Uh, Maryland, sorry guys, it doesn't look that great, but that could be by virtue of the specific sites and habitats that are currently getting sampled, right? So um, we need more data, certainly, uh, for Maryland. But I guess another caveat when we look at those, when we look at that map I just showed you, is each site has a different set of tree species. And we know that tree species is very important for how many. Um, native arthropods can be supported. Um, so 
if these are just a few examples of tree species that occur at many different locations, if we just hold tree species constant and we look at the patterns of caterpillar abundance just on a particular tree species, um, again, our sample size is kind of small at this point. Um, so I would be hesitant to, to make any strong generalizations, but you know, it's interesting. So it looks like beech has higher caterpillar density at the Southern latitudes, whereas sugar maple and red maple, well, there's really just this one really good caterpillar site or set of sites up in Northern Michigan. Um, but that's something, you know, to, to keep in mind, obviously host plant species is gonna be tremendously important. And this is just another way of summarizing that. And this is straight from some of the data visualization tools on our website. Uh, this is for the botanical garden near me, where we this is showing all of the different plant species that we have survey branches on at the botanical garden and how many branches of a given species there are. So half of our, almost half of our branches are American beach down here, um, whereas we just have a handful of some of these other things. But this, the bar graphs is showing you how many bugs per survey you can expect to find, and that varies by plant species, right? So if we if we zero in on this bright pink or magenta uh, fuchsia, what color is that? Fuchsia, we'll call it. Um, caterpillar color. Uh, it looks like red oak actually has the higher caterpillars, higher number of caterpillars per branch compared to um, these other plant species at our site. But you can look at that. Um, you can do this sort of visualization. You can compare one site to another, one year to another, et cetera. Um, but so again, I'm, I'm really highlighting uh, how rich this data set is in terms of all the sources of variability in, and, and all the interesting patterns that, that um, they highlight. So I mentioned, I mentioned, you know, the importance of, of host plant species. Uh, are people familiar with Doug Tallamy? He's, he's uh, at the University of Delaware, and it seems like a group like yours probably is quite familiar with him. Um, so he and his former student, Desiree Narango, um, and I are all writing a big NSF grant proposal that's due in two days. So this is like a pleasant little break for me from my grant proposal writing. But um, you know what he and Desiree have found, I mean, they've done these great studies showing uh, this importance of native versus non-native plant species. And so this graph on the left is just showing uh, across a lot of different yards, and I believe this is all from the DC metro area, across a lot of different yards, if you categorize a, categorize a yard based on what percent of its, of its plants are non-native, and then you ask, well, and how many bugs do you typically get in a sample in that yard? You can see the more non-natives there are, the number of spiders decreases, the number of caterpillars decreases. Um, and so, you know, that's, that, that native non-native difference, of course, is presumably due in large part to the fact that, that arth these arthropods here haven't evolved with those host plants, right? So they don't necessarily have ways to deal with their chemical defenses and the leaves and that sort of thing. Um, so that, that explains this, this potential difference between natives and non-natives. But even among the natives, what, what I was just showing you here I mean, these are basically all native species, and yet there's still tremendous variation. So not all native species are equal either. Um, and so it can, it can depend a lot on, you know, a few high performance plant species. But again, linking back to birds, you know, that because of this pattern on the left, they saw a pattern in the birds with these chickadee nest boxes. So in these same yards, there were nest boxes, chickadees were using, and um, Desiree monitored, uh, I can't remember how many hundreds of nest boxes and you know, monitored the outcome and like how many young successfully were fledged. And it very much depended on um, that yard landscaping and what percentage of the plants were native versus non-native. 
Um, and then a final, a final pattern. Again, I alluded to trends. So this, these are trends for, for four different arthropod groups, caterpillars, grasshoppers, and crickets, leafhoppers, and cicadas, and the true bugs at the botanical garden. So again, this is where we have our longest, one of our longest time series is just seven years now. And we are seeing at the botanical garden some evidence for declines. You can see the, the faded lines, those are the actual data, right? And so you can actually see, well, there's, there's a lot of year-to-year -year variation. This is why it's so important to develop these long-term data sets, because really to have um, even more confidence in these trend estimates, which are the straight lines, um, I, you know, we'll, we'll feel more confident if we have 10 years or more, right? And then we can, we can say, yeah, they really are, um, not just being driven maybe by high, high values in our first year or something like that. Um, but this is, so this is another visualization that you can pull up on our website. And again, you can, you can view the trend, you can view trends for any site in North America. Um, most sites, you know, maybe only have two or three years of data. Um, so some of those trends might not look very interesting yet, but the idea, again, we're trying to encourage people to think about this as a, a long-term monitoring endeavor that's extremely important for us to get a handle on you know, what's happening, what's going on here. Okay, so I'm gonna shift gears now and give you a little sense of, well, okay, if this has piqued your interest, uh, maybe a group of you wanna set up a site somewhere, right? And, and it's a, I mean, it's just a fun thing to look at cool bugs and share them with each other and, and that sort of thing. And at the same time, contribute, uh, useful data to better understand how biodiversity is changing around us. So I mentioned that, um, you know, to participate, it's not just, oh, go out and look at a one branch one time and, you, and you're done with it. The idea is that um, given all these sources of variation um, and even sources of variation from branch to branch, to have a really good feel for what's happening at a particular location, we really want to have um, a largish number of survey branches that are monitored uh, on a regular basis. So, uh, if if you were going to set up a site as a group at a nature center, at a at a state park, something like that, um, then we recommend setting up, uh, choosing and setting up thirty survey trees or thirty survey branches, one one branch per tree. Um, and the way we, uh, we lay these out, these survey branches are arranged in groups of five. So we call a group of five, you can see here we have one of each of five different colors. We just call that a, sur a survey circle. Um, although really, I guess it's an X or a plus, but it's too late. We've already committed to calling them circles. So we're gonna call them a circle. So um, within each of these survey circles or groups of five, um, what, what we ideally do is you've, you've kind of, you've, you, have, you have visualized like, oh yeah, this would be a good general natural area to set up a site. And within that natural area, here's a bunch of foliage and specifically woody vegetation. So trees and shrubs, we're not doing anything on herbaceous vegetation, grasses. Um, got, you know, in gardens. So this is natural woody vegetation. So, you know, where are there branches that you can actually reach that are at eye level? Um, where do you have a lot of vegetation? Oh, oh yeah, there's that part over on the edge of the meadow. Okay, there's some vegetation. So maybe in the center of all that, you'll just subjectively choose a central tree. And then um, having selected that central tree, then the idea is these four satellite trees around it, you'll basically just walk five meters in each cardinal direction and just pick the first one you come to. So um, the way, the, and there's, this is all explained on our website. I won't go into too much detail, but the reason we do this sort of hybrid, like first subjectively choose a general area, then within that, in a standardized fashion, try to choose the remaining branches the reason we do that is, is to just get um, 
kind of a statistically representative sample of the vegetation and the tree species that are present in your area. Uh, and then you would array these, um, these groups of five, these survey circles um, throughout your site. Um, a single survey takes about five minutes, I would say. So 30, 30 surveys times five minutes is two and a half person hours. If you have a group of five people, well, then that's half an hour. That's not very long at all, right? A group of two people, then you're just looking at a little bit more than an hour um, to knock those out. So um, not, too, not too long and, it's, and it, it goes easier the more people you have to share the work with. Um, and then again, this is, this is kind of completely up to sites, whether they choose or what frequency they choose to, to monitor these branches. But, um, if you can do weekly monitoring, that's great. That really gives us that detailed picture of what time in the year um, are is you know are arthropods most abundant, and and we can answer these questions related to birds and other organisms using that information. Um, for people who just want to do it in their own backyard, they don't really want to do it with anyone else. Um, that's totally fine. Um, the minimum size site in terms of number of branches that you can set up is 10 branches. So you could, if you have 10 branches on woody vegetation in your backyard, you know, go for it. If you are really into bugs and you're really into this project, and, but you don't like other people, you can still just do it in your own backyard and you can do 30 branches or however many branches you want. But 10 is the minimum. Um, when you set up a site, you, you say, okay, I'll, I'll, set up 10, I'll, I'll set up at least 10 branches which would be two of these groups of five. Um, here's just an example. So this is, I've been talking about the botanical garden. So we have these beautiful display gardens here, but then outside the display gardens, this area, there's a creek and it's just natural forest, basically. There's a little trail through the forest. So arrayed along this streamside trail, it's just a little half mile trail, we have eight groups of five survey branches. Each of these red circles, uh, is a, there, there are five branches there. And so um, for a total of 40 branches, it's, it's totally flexible. And it kind of depends on the size of your site and where the, where the foliage is and how representative you want to be and over what area and how many, how many branches you want to lay out. All of that is really flexible. It's up to you. This is just meant to be an example of how that can um, be laid out. Uh, if you want to create a site, there's no permission. You don't have to email me and say, hey, Alan, can we create a site? We were thinking about it. Um, yes, create a site. I would love for there to be a site or two created um, from, this, from this talk. Uh, basically, you go to the website. I'll make sure I provide the link later on. But there's a there's like a you have to first create an account. Once you've created a personal account, you can there's a create a site button, and all you got to do is come up with a good name, um, maybe a one sentence description like oh this is a natural area with oak hickory forest whatever you want, um, or it could even be a, a description of an organizational description of like who's doing it or something like that. Um, show me where it is. So zoom in on a map. You set, okay, how many survey? This is where you have to do at least 10 survey plants and you can go upwards from there in multiples of five. And then the last thing you do, if you wanna create a site is you'll, you'll come up with a site password. And so, um, and this is mainly just to prevent just random spamming of you know um, fake data into our database. So the idea is anyone who's submitting data from your site will be told that site password. So, you know, you don't, it's not like you want to make this, um, that combination of uppercase and lowercase and exclamation marks and all the things. Just, you know, this can be a nice simple password that's easy to share with volunteers and visitors or whatever. Um, but the idea is no one's going to submit data from your site without you knowing about it because they will have needed to get that site password from you first. Um, Okay, so uh, what does a survey look like? Well, actually we have two different options and um, 
the idea is you, when you create that site, uh, you're going to decide for yourself, you know what, this option, option one is going to work better for us. We're going to stick with that. You don't want to be switching between survey methods um, and they have their pros and cons. So I'll, let me talk about the two of them. So the visual survey, um, actually, let me see here. I need to turn off my, turn off my background. Uh, oh, you can see my boring living room here, but you can also see a fake potted plant. And this fake potted plant here, it had, first of all, it has a little tag on it. Oop, can we get that leaf out of the way, which has a three letter code. I guess it's upside down. It has a three letter code, T Y B. BYT, BYT. Um, so these, these tags, when you create your site and you say you wanna have 20 branches or 30 branches, then we automatically create this document of tags that you can print out that are you know each, within each survey circle of five, there are five different colored tags and you can print them out. This one is just um, quote unquote, it's, it's laminated cheaply just in packing tape, right? But you could, so it's, they're actually designed to be the size that you can just use packing tape or you can use a laminator. So that's the branch is hanging from the branch now. And so now I can refine that same branch every week and I can do my surveys on it. So a visual survey is to, to kind of standardize, well, how much of a branch are we talking about? And how do we compare what I saw on my branch versus what you saw on your branch? The way we standardize that is by, is by saying a visual survey is an area of 50 leaves and the associated stems and twigs and petioles of those 50 leaves. And so um, what I would do when I come up to this branch, if I'm doing a visual survey, honestly, if I just started looking and a visual survey is very much, you're looking for bugs. Oh, here I see a little Sharpie bug that I drew on there as an example. Um, Right, so I'm gonna be turning, carefully turning the leaves over to you know, inspect the underside and the upper side, make sure my eyes are scanning over all of these petioles and twigs. Um, but I wanna only count 50 leaves. And so if I start looking and I go one, two, three, oh, here's a cool bug. And I'm, I'm entering this bug and all of a sudden, then I've forgotten what leaf number I was up to. So usually what I do is I will just go ahead and count my 50 leaf area first, like before I even look for bugs. I might notice some bugs while I'm doing it, but I don't try to record them. I just go, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50. And that'll take me visually to, you know, this particular branching point or something. And I know, okay, now I don't have to worry about the count. I just know I'm counting everything up to that part and I can just focus on the bugs. But for some people, they can they can keep track just fine. That's just what I do. Okay, so um, that visual inspection, because these insects have undergone millions of years of evolution to avoid being detected by potential predators, right? So some of these, as we well know, are quite cryptic. Um, they have some good camouflage, especially some of these caterpillars. Maybe they're just lying straight right along the leaf midrib or something, or look like a little twig or whatever. Um, so you, you do have to be very methodical with this visual survey. Um, the advantage is you don't need anything. You don't need any materials. You can just show up to the branch and you can just do a visual survey. Um, it helps if you have a phone, but even if you don't have a phone, you, you, there's paper data sheets you could print out and, and, and things like that. Um, the alternative survey method is a, um, called a beat sheet. And so you can see the picture of it uh, down here on the bottom right. And we have instructions for making a simple beat sheet. Um, I mean, really this is just two, two pieces of pine molding with a screw connecting them in the middle and then a two by two foot, you know, cheap sheet fabric that from Joann's or something like that. So the materials are basically five dollars to make a beat sheet, but still, um, you know that that could be 
uh, a barrier or even just a, an inertial hump to get over um, to, to make sure. And, and especially if it's a group of people, then you got to make sure that they have access to the beat sheets or that everybody has their own or whatever. Uh, that said, beat sheets are great um, for, so A, they're faster. You, you don't have to worry about being so methodical anymore because the idea is you're holding um, your beat sheet under the branch. You're really, you're whacking that branch, aiming to dislodge um, all the arthropods onto your sheet. And now they're very easy to see and they're easy to share and show around to other people. And um, it's if kids are getting involved in these surveys, it's much more fun to do a beat sheet. And also it's just easier to show kids um, a bug on a beat sheet than uh, something camouflaged on a branch, et cetera. So, um, so that's, that is a decision to be made. Like, well, okay, do we wanna, should we go, go ahead and make a bunch of beat sheets and then let's just stick with that and we have a way of distributing them to the people who are gonna use them or do we wanna do the visual survey? Either one is fine. Uh, you will specify which um, method you're using when you, um, when you do that survey. And I'm ha happy to answer more questions about that as, as, um, as we go along. Let me just actually show you, I think maybe it would be helpful to just give you a sense of what it looks like, um, what, what the app looks like, and therefore what the information you're being asked for is. So here's our website. Um, it's caterpillarscount.unc.edu. And um, you can actually, I mentioned that well, if you don't have a, a cell phone and you don't want to get the app, you can record things on a paper data sheet and those paper data sheets are printable from the website. Um, and then you can come back to the website later on and submit your observations. And so this page, this submit observations page, if you just imagine it compressed laterally, that's what it looks like on your phone. This is all kind of spread out wide, but um, <clears throat> this is what the app looks like basically. So I showed you that br this, this branch has this three letter code on it, right? So you would enter that three letter code. I'm gonna enter this one just because I know this is a, an example branch site. But so just by typing that three letter code, it already knows where I am, what tree species is associated with that code because I entered that at the beginning. Um, so you say, okay, here's, here's where I am. I'm surveying this branch. <clears throat> uh, the date and time are automatically filling. I'm gonna tell it I'm gonna do a visual or a beat sheet survey. Uh, any other random notes about um, the day or the branch, you can enter there, but that's optional. And then the question is, okay, you did a survey. So what did you find, right? Did you find anything? And I mentioned at the outset, if you, sometimes you will look at a branch and you will see nothing. That is boring, but it's important to know. It's really useful information. This is again, where we, our project really differs from my naturalist in capturing those zeros. Uh, but hopefully you will often see really interesting things. If you say, yes, I did see something, then these are your options. So for the most part, we're asking people to learn how to identify things down to level of order, which is again, caterpillar versus fly versus beetle versus grasshopper. Um, there's a few things that are like ants are a family within Hymenoptera. Um, Leafhoppers and aphids and psyllids, those are suborders within the order Hemiptera. Um, but for the most part, these are orders. And so let's say we have the great fortune to find a caterpillar. So we say, okay, well, yeah, I saw a caterpillar. All right, there's a, caterpillars actually have a few extra details that we ask, ask you about. Oh, was that a hairy or spiny caterpillar? Was it rolled up in a leaf or was it in a silk tent? Those are all things that might mean it's less available as bird food. Um, so that's, that's why we ask for that information. Um, we ask for its length. So this is where you start practicing estimating length in millimeters. And it's really easy if you can just um, remember the width of your thumbnail and pinky nail. Most bugs are gonna be either in that size range or simple multiples of that and that can you'll all it's a ruler you'll always have with you right but um so let's say we you know we we saw a nice looking caterpillar it's 30 millimeters 
In fact, let's say maybe there were two of them hanging out on that, that branch. That would have been great. I mentioned that optionally, you can upload a photo if you want. And we really encourage you to do that for caterpillars, especially caterpillar, because you're not going to see a caterpillar every branch you look at. It's kind of a special event when you do hit one. And we like to try to figure out, well, what kind of caterpillars are out there? And these photos will help us do that through iNaturalist. Um, but that's optional. And so you, if you do whatever, whether you upload the photo or not, you save that. And oh, maybe you also saw some ants. We'll just add a few other, maybe there was a whole bunch of ants on there. And you also saw some spider, just uh, six millimeters wide or uh, long, sorry. Right, so then, so, oh, here's our, this is our survey. And so if, if that's all the bugs that we happen to see on our branch, we, we move on here. And it, because we entered that three letter code and it knows because we previously said, oh, if that, that branch is a beach, it fills that in for us. Um, the last few things it asks about, now I said with the visual survey, we, um, everybody's gonna look at 50 leaves. But 50 leaves on a beech tree might be a different total leaf area than 50 leaves on a magnolia or something. So we do ask you to give you to give a rough estimate. What was the average leaf length in centimeters for that leaf? You know, for this beech, maybe it was, you know, about 10, uh, about 10, 10 centimeters, which is about four inches. Um, and the 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 number of leaves. Well, you were told a visual survey is 50 leaves. So it doesn't even let you change that number. Um, the last piece is, well, how munched, how chomped were your leaves on your branch on average? Because maybe you didn't see any caterpillars, but you saw lots of evidence that there were caterpillars there in the past. And so um, we have you estimate this. And we have some, some tips for how, you, how to get good at, at making these um, decisions between, you know, less than 5% or 6% or more or whatever. So you'll choose this herbivory score and that's it. And then you'll submit that and it goes to our data set, database. Um, so you can do that in the field with, so that could, that's exactly what it looks like on your phone. Um, you submit it. As soon as you hit submit, <clears throat> it's in our database. You can go back to your home and explore the data on your laptop or something um, through our visualization tools. Um, I see that, well, uh, let me just, um, I think it's maybe most useful for me to just stop and ask folks for questions because I know we're already after eight. Um, let me see the other highlights. There's ways you can just play around um, with the app. We have a virtual survey. It's almost like a video game that shows you a screen like this one and you have to find the bugs. You click on them. And then the little drop downs is okay. Now that you found it, identify it and estimate its length. And then it gives you scores on how good you are at finding, identifying, and length estimation. Um, so that's a fun game to play on our website. And we have um, ID sheets and just a, a straight up arthropod ID quiz to get practice learning these different arthropod groups. So lots of resources there. I mentioned data visualization tools. Um, and the, we have a, a bunch of other resources for training and for classroom activities. And then at the end of every year, you will get a site report that summarizes everything that was found, who participated, um, you know, how much work was done, and it'll include graphs. So this is, this is all taken from, again, the Botanical Garden um, site report here. It compares how, how your site fares against the other best sites uh, around the country, around North America. Um, it will Once you've collected more than one year of data, it shows how what you saw this year compared to the previous year. Um, so you'll get this uh, site report emailed out to you at the end of each year. Um, so I think I have probably talked at you too much at this point. So let me stop and just see what kinds of questions folks have. I'm happy to, to answer anything that's come up. Oh, the last thing I'll mention, I guess, is that um, if you want a lot of the similar information, maybe just slightly more information uh, detail, or you wanna um, 
a friend who was not available, who wasn't present tonight, you want to point them towards this project. We have these upcoming webinars. Uh, these each one is an hour and a half, so it just is a little bit more time to get into some of the the resources and things like that. And they're all free, of course. You can find the Zoom registration link on that get started page of the website. But yeah, so let me let me stop there and see what questions um, people have. Thanks, Alan. That's great. I'm so excited. I I, I want I want us to get uh, I want us to have a a site or two set up for um, for the project. We do have some questions and. Let's see. Um, Donna wants to know in, the, in your data, is there a way to find out who is involved in the Caterpillar account and doing this in, in a county or state? Is there a way to, to, to connect with those people? Uh, there is. The easiest way, um, let me go back to sharing my screen again. Um, so I think there's two ways to do that. The quick and dirty way I'm going to do. If you go to explore and maps and graphs here, um, you'll find a map of all of the sites. And so we can zoom in. So in Maryland, it looks like, what is this one is Oregon Ridge Nature Center, um, Lake Elkhorn Trail, and then in Rockville. Um, so you can you can find, and then this this gray dot means someone created a, a site at Tuckahoe State Park, but no one's actually ever submitted data from that point. So you can you can use this maps and graphs page to see where the existing sites are, and then beyond that, if you wanted to um, get in touch with the people, this is where actually I haven't looked at for this in a while. So let me, uh, I think, on the get started page, find an existing site near you. So here, it looks like we have a list of sites. And so here are the Maryland sites, and then um, they have email links, or they sh should have email links to the people who are involved. Oh, great. Wonderful. So it looks like Oregon Ridge and Lake Elkhorn. Okay. And then we're going to, we'll be adding to that soon, Alan. Um, Jane wants to know how do you measure the caterpillar biomass? Mm, right. Uh, yeah. So some of the graphs I showed were caterpillar biomass, and you, you will not. Um, estimate biomass, but this is where um, your length estimation comes in handy. So by estimating, um, oh, I saw a 30 millimeter long caterpillar. Uh, we, we have some equations we can just plug that 30 millimeters into to get a rough estimate of how much biomass that would be. Now, of course, you can imagine that caterpillars do vary a bit in how long and skinny they are versus big and fat and that it should be a different equation depending on which kind of growth form um, that caterpillar takes. We kind of use a generic equation that's kind of like an average caterpillar of that length, how, how much would that weigh? That, that's what we do use to get those biomass estimates. But um, you don't have to go out there with a teeny tiny scale or anything like that. You're just estimating the length and we can come up with those biomass estimates. Okay, Cherry asks what, if the, if do insects vary by elevation within a tree? And so how are those that are not at eye level surveyed? That is a fantastic question. And, um, and we are absolutely um, limited. The project is very much limited by the, the foliage we can access, right? Which is basically at ground level. And these tree canopies go way up. And in some cases, we, we know that um, there is sort of vertical stratification or zonation of different arthropod types. Um, the, the way we have been getting at that, um, or trying to feel confident that, that what we're seeing at ground level is representative, we do something called frass trapping. So frass is just caterpillar poop, basically. It rains down. All those caterpillars up in the canopy are pooping. That frass is just raining down. So we put out, we actually have a whole separate project and, and you're welcome, people are welcome to, to do this project as well. If you're interested, I can provide information, but we basically, you know, we cut off the bottom of milk jugs, gallon milk jugs. And so we put those upside down as like a funnel that we line with really thin mesh. And we go out uh, a couple, you know, once or twice a week and collect whatever frass has 
fallen in there and then we go back in the lab and in this case you know we we actually take it to my lab and we weigh that frass on a micro balance and what we have found um, is that at least in some site years uh, and we're still kind of a, constantly monitoring this but the pattern of seasonal timing in that frass biomass it mirrors the pattern of caterpillars that we observe at ground level but that may not be true everywhere. And so that's a really important question to ask is like, is this representative? Do we have um, evidence that what we're seeing at ground level is representative? So great question. Um, and Molly wants clarification uh, for a backyard survey with the minimum of 10, do all the branches need to be on different trees or shrubs? And I guess that goes for all of the, um, whether it's 10 in a backyard or in a natural area. Uh, yeah, they should be. They should be on different branches, uh, or I'm sorry, on different individual trees or shrubs. The one exception I can think of, uh, in some cases, maybe we were in an area where vegetation was limiting, and it was this big tree that had branches that were swooping out in all directions, and so like from one sample branch to another, there was probably um, almost 10 meters between them or something like that. And, and so in some of those scenarios, we, we might use a couple of branches on the same tree. But in general, um, with that layout, they should be, because all of these sample branches are supposed to be at least five meters apart or so. Um, so they should be on separate individual plants. And Lori asks, when you use a beach, beach sheet, um, after you collect them, do you just re-release them onto the area that they were collected? Great question. Um, so typically what we do is for the, for the less mobile things, caterpillars especially, um, that are really dependent on that, um, that host plant and that aren't super mobile, we'll put those back on the branch for sure. Um, Various things will just fly or hop away on their own. And then and other things that are pretty mobile, um, maybe we'll shake the beat sheet over the branch, but not really worry about it too much. We'll assume that the things can find their way back. But caterpillars in particular, we, we definitely place back on the branch. And Jody asks, should we use the same trees every year? Uh, yes. So um, ideally, you know, if you set up a site with 30 trees, 30 tree branches, um, you know, maybe every year, one or two of those branches, there's going to be a tree fall, something's going to happen to the tree or something, you know, and you'll have to, you'll have to um, create, you'll have to find a new branch. But ideally, you have these things tagged and, um, and those tags are just hanging up kind of permanently. So, because that's what actually creates the best comparison uh, from year to year. You're holding the trees constant and you're seeing, okay, well, how much was there this year versus last year, given that set of trees? All right. Becca says she's already added the app and joint. So that's All good. Right. And Lynn says the acronym or abbreviation for the branch is, is that ascribed by you or do we come up with that? Yep. Uh, let me show you what that looks like here. So I will, um, so let's say you've already created a site. Um, <clears throat> once you've created a site, you can go to this manage my sites page. And um, so I'll just, I can see all of them. You would just see one, a single site, but all Acadia National Park up in Maine, they've actually been doing it for several years now. Um, I can, this is where I can select my site and I can go to the print tags page. So this page gets created automatically for you. And now of course, we don't know what plant species there are. So before you print the, so when you first create the site, this is just gonna say NA for all of the plant species. So before you print them, uh, you probably wanna go in to this edit survey plants page here and say, oh, okay, BQB. Like I've already, I've, I've walked around my area. I know roughly what, where good trees would be. Okay, I'm gonna make this one be BQB. And I happen to know it's an American mountain ash. So, and you can do this on your phone um, while you're wandering around. You can edit the survey plants and type in what plant species it is. So once you've typed in all of these plant species names, 
then that name will show up on the um, on the tags when you print them. Great. And Donna says there's no one in Delaware. Hmm. Hmm. Got to get Doug Tallamy to do one in his backyard. Yeah, there you go. Get Doug on that. Not that he's not doing anything else with his time. Um, <laughs> well, Alan, this was great. I think that you have inspired us. Um, and it's a wonderful way to get involved. And like, a, we really want to serve as a conduit um, uh, between uh, volunteers and citizen science projects like yours. Um, because it, it, it is important, as you mentioned, the data that is collected is 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 equally as good as uh, and sometimes better than the experts. And we have more eyes out there. So let's all get together and uh, do some real science and, and have some better understanding of what's going on. So out there um, looking, you can look for um, with a purpose. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I hope that we can uh, stay in touch as we um, get in more involved with Caterpillar Count. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Thanks so much for inviting me to speak. And, and if, so there's a bunch of information um, on the website. Like if you are interested in, in starting, there's tips for how to, how to set up your site. There's a frequently asked questions page. Um, so, you know, there's some videos explaining things as well, but, but you know, if you've, if you've looked at that stuff and you still have questions, um, caterpillarscount at gmail.com. Feel free to email and um, I'll be happy to, to um, yeah, help you out with whatever is holding you up. Great. And for every, anybody else who's still, who's still on, who haven't popped off already, um, if you're interested in maybe being a lead, um, a volunteer lead on this project with, uh, for the society and the lab club, um, let's chat. Then you have my email. All right, everybody, stay well, stay safe, and good luck with your grant <laughs> your grant writing. Thank you, uh, Alan. Uh, take care. Bye. Thank you so much.